Okay, in this clip we're going to work our way through the Edexcel June 2014 Calculator Higher Tier exam paper and it's got the code 1MAO2H. Now the first page you come to is the formula sheet. And I just want to emphasize here how important it is to remember about this sheet as you're working your way through the exam paper because you never know if there's going to be something on this sheet here that can help you gain a few marks. And as you can see down here, I've added on a couple of those formula that are not on this sheet that I'm going into that exam trying to remember. Now I know it says you must not write on this formula page at the top here, but it's just reminding you that anything you do write on here won't get any marks. So these are just to help me, if I need to, glance back at this formula sheet a little bit later on. Okay, question number one. The point A has coordinates two, three. The point B has coordinates six, eight. M is the midpoint of the line AB. So the line that joins from A to B, M is right in the middle find the coordinates of M. And I've actually drawn a little sketch here of what it looks like in the coordinate axis. So we've got A, 2, 3, B, 6, 8, and somewhere in the middle here is going to be this point M. Now to find the middle of coordinates, we just got to find in the middle of these two numbers and the middle of these two numbers. So in between the X numbers, which are the 6 and the 2, and in the middle of the 8 and the 3 for the Y numbers. So what I'm going to do in my working out space here, I'm just going to do 2 plus 6, which comes to 8. Half of 8, because that's going to be right in the middle, is 4. So all I did was add my two x numbers together and half it to find right in the middle between the 2 and the 6. The same with the 3 and the 8. So 3 plus 8 is 11. Half of 11 is 5.5. So my coordinate for my answer here, the x number is 4 and my y value is 5.5. I'm going to put those in brackets just like they did here for the coordinates. So that's question number one, finding the midpoint between two coordinates a and b. 4 and 5.5 for two marks. Right, moving on to question number two. Now question number two actually goes onto the next page as well for part C and you can find support on this type of question which is scatter graphs with the top 40 clip number two and the total for this question is actually worth four marks. We've got quite a few marks for this question and it's a scatter graph question. The table shows the average temperature on each of seven days and the number of units of gas used to heat a house on these days. Then you've got this table with the average temperature going across and the units of gas used that goes with that average temperature. Then you've got the graph underneath, the scatter graph, units of gas used up the side, average temperature along the bottom. And we've got some of these crosses done for us already. Part A. Complete the scatter graph to show the information in the table. The first five points have been plotted for you for one mark. So the first five have been done for us. So one, two, three, four, five. We've got to plot these here. So 12 goes with six. So average temperature, which is on the bottom, 12 goes with six. And we put a cross there. 13 goes with 2. Now 13 is right in the middle between the 12 and the 14 and 2. So these are quite nice ones for the scale. There's our two extra points for part A. Part B. Describe the relationship between the average temperature and the number of units of gas used. So what's, what's the relationship that's been shown in this graph? Now the crosses are coming down. So that is negative correlation. Negative correlation for the one mark. So negative correlation for the one mark there. If the crosses were going up in this direction, that's positive correlation, but because the crosses are coming down, it's negative correlation. Now with scatter graphs, the hint I always give is even if they don't ask for it, which they're not asking for it here just yet, and they may not ask for it, is a line of best fit. Now, a line of best fit follows the crosses in the direction of the crosses, and you've got roughly the same on each side. So there's the direction. Here's my ruler. And my line of best fit is going to go roughly. It doesn't have to go to the axes. It's just got to go roughly so the same amount of crosses each side of the line. 
and there's my line of best fit. Now that's going to help us when it comes to working out this part here for part C. Estimate the average temperature on a day when 12 units of gas are used. So we need to go back to that graph, back to that scatter graph, and we need to estimate the average temperature on a day when 12 units of gas are used. So 12 units of gas is here. We need to get our ruler again, and we're going to read across from 12 and hit our line of best fit. And this is why it's so important that we put a line of best fit on so we know exactly where we're going across to. As soon as you touch that line of best fit, then we bring the line down. And this is where I am going to have to work out what my scale is. So it's this number here. So this is 6. That's going to be 7. That means they're going to go up in 0.2s. So 0 0.2, 4, 6, 8, and 7. So 0 0.2, 4, 6. So that is going to be 6.6 .6 for my answer for that question there. Now, depending on what your angle of line of best fit is, this number is going to be slightly different. But I think the range and the answer that you're allowed to have for this question is between 5 and 7. Now, the line of best fit helps me get between that, that required answer of 5 to 7 because I know exactly where to come down to. Across at 12, down, and it's 6.6 .6 for my answer for part C. And that's worth two marks. And again, support and help on scattergraph type questions can be found on the top 40, clip number two. Right, moving to question number three. Okay, question number three is worth two marks. And we're given that x equals 0 0.7. Work out the value of, and then we've got x plus 1 in brackets squared, a divide line that goes underneath everything, and then 2x on the bottom. So we've got to work out what's in the bracket first, then we've got to work out what's on the bottom of this divide line, then we can square that top number only and divide it by what we've worked out on the bottom. So it's just a matter of making sure we do this in nice, simple steps. So all I'm going to do to start with is substitute, so I'm going to put that 0 0.7 into this equation here. So where I see x, I'm going to write 0 0.7 plus 1 squared. On the bottom, 2x means 2 times x, so 2 times 0 0.7. Now I'm going to tidy this all up a little bit, and I'm going to do this without a calculator to start with. 0.7 plus 1 inside the brackets is 1.7 squared. So I've worked out what's inside the brackets first before even worrying about this square. On the bottom of the divide line, 2 times 0 0.7 is 1.4. Now at this point I'm going to bring the calculator in. I'm going to work out 1.7 squared. 2.89, so the top number is 2.89, the bottom number is already worked out at 1.4, that line means divide, so it's 2.89 divided by 1.4, and there's my answer. And it does actually say here, write down all the figures on your calculator display, so I've got to write down all of those for my answer on this dotted line for the two marks. So it's 2.06428571. Four for those two marks, and that's finished. Question number three, substitution and using your calculator. Quite straightforward for question number three. Moving on to question number four. Okay, question number four, and if I just look down here, I've put a note, top 40, clip number 31 for support on this type of question. Here is a circle, and they've drawn a circle for us diagram not accurately drawn, which is the standard phrase, so it's not really 9 centimetres, but what we're dealing with is a 9 centimetre circle. The diameter of the circle is 9 centimetres, so going right across the middle. Work out the circumference of this circle, give your answer correct to three significant figures, and it's worth two marks. Now if I just bring back in at this point my formula sheet, and if you remember what I said, I've jotted down a couple of extra formulas here. Cherry pie delicious, apple pies are too. That's my way of remembering the formula for circumference of a circle and area of a circle. And again, support clip number 31 for the top 40. 
So cherry pie delicious to work out the circumference. And that's what we're being asked to do on this question, work out the circumference. So I'm just going to write down here, cherry pie delicious. Pi is the button on the calculator multiplied by the diameter, which is nine centimeters. So in my calculator, it's pi, which on this calculator is shift and this times by 10 button. And there's my pi symbol times by nine. Now I'm going to write down everything I see on the display first before worrying about this rounding to three significant figures. So it's 28 point two seven four three 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 eight eight and then it says we need to round it and give our answer to three significant figures three significant figures starts from the front so one two three so i'm going to underline those first three but we do have to look at the next one along if it's five or above it's going to shoot this up so it does so it's 28.3 centimeters for question number four and again support can be found on the top 40 clip 31 for that type of question for question number four Right, moving on to question number five. Okay, question number five, we've got this picture here with two triangles, A and B, and it says describe the single transformation that maps triangle A onto triangle B. And here we go again, we've got support for this type of question on the top 40, clip number 24. And it's worth two marks. Single transformation, that's one of the rotation, reflection, enlargement, or translation. Looking at this, the best way of finding out which one it is is to rule out the others. If it was a rotation, you end up on your side or upside down, that's not happening here. If it's an enlargement, you end up being bigger or smaller, that's not happening here. If it's a reflection, it looks like it's been in a mirror and it's reflected, again, that's not happened here. So that's leaving translation. And translation is the one where the image stays exactly the same it's just been moved. And that's what's happened here. It's exactly the same picture, it's just in a different place. So for one mark, translation. And for the second mark, we've got to explain in numbers how it's gone from A to B, because it says from A to B. Now it's moved, and I'm gonna choose one corner. So I'm gonna choose that corner, which is the same as that corner. And it's moved one, two, three, four, five to the right just check the scale and make sure that these are in ones which they are so it's gone five to the right so in my column vector a positive five and then it's gone one two three jumps down and again check the scale to make sure these are in ones which it is so it's gone three down so to show three down it's a minus three in that column vector so for two marks First mark is translation, second mark is this column vector along the corridor, up and down the stairs. So five to the right, positive, three down, minus three. Again, support for this type of question, top 40, clip 24. Moving on to question number six. Okay, question number six has got quite a lot to read through here and it's worth three marks. Sue is driving home from a friend's house. Sue drives 10 miles from a friend's house to the motorway, 240 miles on the motorway, five miles from the motorway to her home. So she looks like she's got a total journey of, a, of 255 miles. Sue takes 20 minutes to drive from a friend's house to the motorway, drives at an average speed of 60 miles per hour on the motorway, takes 25 minutes to drive from the motorway to her home. So these amounts here relate to these three parts here. Sue stops for a 30 minute rest on a drive home. Sue leaves a friend's house at 9 a.m. What time does Sue get home? You must show all you work in. So let's just go back to the start here for this first part of the journey. Sue drives 10 miles from a friend's house to the motorway. And it says here, Sue takes 20 minutes to drive from a friend's house to the motorway. So this first part of the journey takes 20 minutes. So I'm just gonna write that there, 20 minutes for that first part. It's 240 miles on the motorway. And then it says, Sue drives at an average speed of 60 miles per hour on the motorway. So it doesn't actually tell us how long Sue's on the motorway. 
but it does say that she drives at an average speed of 60 miles per hour. Now what you've got to think about, if you drive 60 miles per hour, that means it takes you one hour to drive 60 miles. So let's just see how many 60s fit into 240. So 60, 120, 180, and then 240. So 60 fits into 240 exactly four times. So if it's 60 miles per hour, so 60 miles in one hour, 120 miles in two hours, 180 miles in three hours, 240 miles in four hours. So that's gonna take four hours, that part of the journey. And then this one here, five miles from the motorway to her home, it takes 25 minutes to drive from the motorway to her home, so 25 minutes. So 20 minutes, four hours and 25 minutes. But it does say as well that Sue stops for a 30 minute rest. So on top of these, we've got to add up our 30 minutes as well. So I'm just gonna, because again, it says here, you must show all your work in. So the 20 minutes plus the four hours so I'm going to put 20 minutes and four hours and then the 25 minutes and then don't forget the 30 minutes as well. So if we add all these up, that's, that's four hours, um, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 75 minutes for these three. Now 75 minutes is one hour and 15 minutes because again, 60 minutes in an hour. So I've just added these three minute parts up and that comes to 75 minutes. So that's four hours and 75 minutes, but really that's five hours and 15 minutes. So five hours, 15 minutes, just by adding up those four parts. And again, we've got to go back to this part here. Sue leaves a friend's house at 9 a.m. The total journey, including that break, is five hours and 15 minutes. So nine plus the five, nine, 10, 11, 12, one, two, and then the 15 minutes. So it's going to be 2.15 in the afternoon, 2.15 p.m. That I'm gonna put on my dotted line down here for when Sue gets home. So just going through that part again, I've worked out how long it is for these three parts of the journey. The first and the last part were quite straightforward. It told us the middle part was telling us about miles per hour. Again, 60 miles per hour means 60 miles in one hour. So 240 miles will take us four hours. There was 30 minutes as well for the break. Four hours and then added on the minutes. The minutes came to 75 minutes. 75 minutes is an hour and 15. So four plus one hour and 15 is five hours and 15. Start at nine o'clock, add the five hours 15 on, comes to 2.15 in the afternoon, 2.15 p.m. for the three marks for question number six. So it's quite a lot of words, a lot of reading there, but the actual maths involved is quite simple for those three marks. Okay, moving on to question number seven. Okay, question number seven's got a star here, the little asterisk, which means we are gonna get marked on our quality of written communication. So we are gonna have to put some words down as part of our answer on this one. We've got two straight lines and this line chopping through it. We've got some words here we'll read through in a second. And it's worth three marks for question number seven. And you can find support for this type of question on the top 40, clip number 30. Eight. Now we've got these two straight lines and they're parallel. And I know they're parallel because of these arrows here. So these two lines are never gonna meet. And then we've got this other line chopping through. PRS, PRS and TWY are parallel straight lines. Like what you can tell from the picture with, with these arrows on. So they'll never meet, they're like train tracks. QRWZ, this line here, is a straight line. Work out the value of x, give reasons for your answer. So this part here, give reasons for your answer, is gonna be why it's a starred question there. So there are numerous ways of working out this, this answer. And again, clip number 38 in the top 40 goes through the different ways. And I'm just gonna highlight one particular way here. We're looking for f's and z's. Now I'm looking at straight away, this z angle here, and z, is alternate, the first and last letter of the alphabet. Z, last letter, A for alternate, the first letter of the alphabet. 
Now in order to work out x, we need the other angle in the corner of the z. Now as soon as I put that on, this jumps out at me, that this is one big straight line, 180 degrees. So if I do 180, take away my 126, so I'm going to write that down, that's my thought process. So 180 degrees take away my 126 degrees comes to 54 degrees. 180 take away the 126, just to work out what this angle here is. So I'm going to write that on my picture. So that's 54 degrees, and then I've worked out in the corner of my Z, which is alternate. So my answer for X here is 54 degrees. So my answer is 54 degrees. Now I am going to put here as bullet points the steps that I've got to get there. The first thing I did, really in terms of the maths, was this angles on a straight line add up to 180. So I'm going to put that here. Angles on a straight line equals 180 degrees. And then the next point that I used was the alternate angles, and they're equal, aren't they? So alternate angles are equal. And I'm going to just put underneath there then, so x equals 54 degrees. Angles on a straight line, alternate. There are other ways of doing this, and again, you can find support on the different ways with the top 40, click number 38. But that's worth our three marks there, and our quality of written communication is quite clear. Two steps that I did to get there in words, and my final answer for 54 degrees. That's question number seven. Right, moving on to question number eight. Okay, question number eight is split up into A, B, and C, with a total of six marks for this question. Lorna carries out a survey about the number of times customers go to a shop. She asks at random 100 customers how many times they went to the shop last month. The table shows Lorna's results, number of times going across, and the frequency, the amount of people that actually visited that many times. One of the 100 customers is chosen at random. Part A. What is the probability that this customer went to the shop five or more times? for two marks. Probability must be written down as a percentage, a decimal, or a fraction. Now I like dealing with fractions on these type of questions. The shop five or more times is this one, this one, and this one. So 13 plus 11 plus five, that's 29 people. So 29 out of, as a fraction, out of the 100 for two marks. So probability, percentage, decimal, or fraction, I like to deal with as a fraction five or more times these added up out of the 100. Last month the shop had a total of 1500 customers. Part B, work out an estimate for the number of customers who went to the shop exactly two times last month. Now out of the people asked at random, two times was 13 out of 100. Now I'm going to jot that down here in my working out, 13 out of 100. Now that is actually 13%. So I need to work out 13% of 1,500. Now there are various ways of doing these type of estimate questions, but what I'm doing, I'm going back to the table, I'm looking at what two was, it was 13 out of 100. I've got to use this 13 somehow. 13 out of 100 is 13%, and I like to deal with percentages as these type of questions. Now again, we've got a calculator, so we can apply this 13% of 1,500 in many different ways, but I'm gonna do it without a calculator. I'm gonna get 10% first, so 10% of 1,500, no decimal point, ends in a zero, so it's 150. I'm gonna need a 1%, so I can do the same thing again to this number to get to 1%, which is 15. I'm gonna need another two of those to get it up to 13%, so 315, so 10 plus the three ones makes 13, and the 150 plus the 315, so 13% comes to 195 for my two marks for this estimate of the number of customers who went into the shop exactly two times, so the sample's 13 out of 100, 13 out of 100 is 13%, 13% of 1500 comes out as 
195 for part B. The owner of a different shop is carrying out a survey on the ages of his customers. He records the ages of the first 10 customers in the shop after 9 a.m. one morning. Part C. This may not be a suitable sample. Give two reasons why. Two reasons for two marks. The first one is about the size of the sample. 10 is not enough. So the sample size is too small for the first mark. The second mark has got to be about the fact that it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Now at this time, the first 10 customers are not going to be representative. They're not going to be representing the whole of the ages throughout a whole day, a whole week or a whole month. You're going to get an unfair representation for the first 10 people at a particular time. So at this time, at 9 o'clock, at this time, not all ages will be represented. So we're trying to say that you're not going to have all ages, all possible ages, represented at just at that 9 o'clock and the first 10 customers. So sample size too small, 10 too small, and at this time, 9 o'clock, not all ages will be represented for those two marks for part C, with a total of six marks for the total of that question there for question eight. Okay, moving on to question number nine. Okay, question number nine is worth four marks. And we've got this diagram of a trapezium. The diagram shows a trapezium. And then we've got some information here. AD, so that line there, is X centimetres. Now all I'm going to do, I'm just going to put that on the picture because I like my pictures to be the same as what the words are saying. So A to D is X centimetres, so I'm going to call that X. BC, so that line there, is the same as the length as AD, so that means that must be X as well. Now AB, this line here, is twice the length of AD. So if it's twice the length of that, that line there must be two lots of X, and we just put two X for that. Now DC, this line here, is four centimetres longer than that one, so it's going to be this line plus four centimetres, so it's going to be two X plus four. So this bit of information here I've just got on the picture. AD is X, BC is the same, AB is twice AD, so it's two X, and DC is four centimetres longer than that, so it's this plus four. The perimeter of the trapezium, so perimeter means all the way round, is 38 centimetres. Work out the length of AD, so basically what's the value of X, another way of saying what's the value of X. So let's forget about that for a second, let's just look at this. The perimeter of the trapezium is 38, so that means that all these added up around the outside comes to 38. So that's what I'm going to do in my working out bit here. I'm going to go round and add them all up. So 2x add x, add 2x plus 4, add another x. So I'm going to write that down, so 2x plus x plus 2x plus 4 plus x. So all I've done is that plus that plus that plus that. And that comes to the perimeter, which is 38. Now this here needs tidying up. So I've got 2x plus another x is 3x, plus another 2x is 5x, plus another x is 6x. So I've got 6x, I've got this 4 equals 38. So all I've done is tidied this up and added the x's together, which is 6x plus 4 equals 38. Now I need to work out what this value of x is, which is a to d. So I need to work out the value of this. And I'm going to do that by solving this equation. And I'm going to balance it out. I want to get rid of this plus 4, so I'm going to do a takeaway 4. That goes from that side, but I've also got to do a takeaway 4 from this side. So 6x now comes to, this bit's gone, 34. I need to get rid of this 6 to get x on its own. It's a times by 6, so the way of getting rid of it is doing a divide by 6. Gone. But whenever I do one side, I've got to do the other side. So the value of x on that line AD is 34 divided by 6. So on my calculator, 34 divided by 6 is 5.66666 recurring, which is actually 5 and 2 thirds. So I can actually write 5 and 2 thirds down or 5.6 with a dot above it. So 
recur in there. So that's what I'm going to put here, 5.6 with a dot above. I could put 5 and 2 thirds for my answer if I wanted to, but I'm just going to put it as I saw on my calculator, 5.66666, which is 5.6 with a dot above it to show it's recurring centimetres. And all I've done is put the information in words there on the picture, realise the word perimeter means all the way around, solve it, and get the value of x, which is the line AD, which is 5.6 recurring centimetres for question number nine, which is worth four marks. Right, let's move on to question number 10. Okay, question number 10 is split up into A, B, C and D. And for parts A, B and C, you can find support with the top 40 clip number 36. So part A, simplify P cubed, P to the power of three, all squared. When you see the brackets here, that means you times the powers. So that's going to be P to the power of six for one mark. Part B, simplify t to the power of 8 divided by t cubed. Now when you divide powers, as long as the base is the same, the t and the t, which it is, you can take the powers away. So it's going to be t to the power of 8 take away 3, which is 5. Part C, we've got this equation here, so 2 cubed times 2 to the power of n equals 2 to the power of 9. Part C, work out the value of n. When we see a times, the indices, the powers, you add them. So 3 plus something equals 9. So the value of n there has got to be 6. Because 3 plus the 6 comes to the 9 and we're working out the value of n, the power. So it comes to 6 for one mark. And then for part D, we've got 2x cubed equals 128. Work out the value of x. And this is a solving, so we've got to work out the value of x. So 2x cubed equals 128. That 2 is in the way first. We're going to get rid of that 2. And it's times in, so we divide by 2. So x cubed is 128 divided by 2. Half of 128 is 64. To get rid of the cubed now, the opposite of cubing is cube root. So if I cube root both sides, that's going to cancel off with that part, but I've got a cube root this side as well. So the cube root, and there is a cube root button on a calculator, and for mine it's the shift and behind there. So shift cube root of 64 is 4. So x equals 4 for the one mark for part d. And again, for these type of questions, for A, B and C, the support with top 40 clip number 36. Right, let's move on to question number 11. Okay, question number 11 is worth five marks. And we've got this diagram of a rectangle here. And it says, here is a plan of Martin's driveway. Four metres by 11 metres rectangle. Martin is going to cover his driveway with gravel. The gravel will be six centimetres deep. Now that's not on the image here, on the picture. We've got to imagine that this actually goes down as well, six centimetres. Now what's jumping out at me here is that that's in centimetres, but these are in metres. And that's something that we're going to deal with throughout this question. Gravel is sold in bags. There are 0.4 metres cubed of gravel in each bag. Now, metres cubed, that unit is a unit of volume. So we're talking about volume with this question. Each bag of gravel costs £38. Martin gets a discount of 30% off the cost of the gravel. Work out the total amount of money Martin pays for the gravel. So we've got this multi-step question here. And we're starting off with this rectangle that's actually a 3D picture. It actually goes down six centimetres. So what we're going to do is work out the volume of what this space actually can hold. And the volume of a rectangular prism, which is what it will be, is going to be base times height, then the depth. So 11 times 4, but not times by 6, because that's in centimetres. So I need to change this to metres first, so we've got them all the same, or change these to centimetres. Now I'm going to advise changing this to metres because it says here 
that the bags come in 0.4 meters cubed. So I want to stick to meters cubed. So I'm going to change this one to meters. So I need to divide that by 100 to get that to be in meters. So 6 divided by 100 is going to be 0.06. So the decimal point was there. It's got hop twice, 1, 2. So it's 0.06 meters. So to work out the volume of his driveway, I need to do 11 times 4 and then times by 0 0.06. So I'll bring in the calculator for that one. 11 times 4, that comes to 44, then times it by the depth, which is 0 0.06, 2.64, 2.64 metres cubed. 2.64 metres cubed. So that's the volume of the driveway. 2.64 metres cubed. There are 0.4 metres cubed of gravel in each bag. So I've got to see how many bags we need to get to cover this area. So 2.64 divide by 0.4. 2.64 divide by the 0.4 is going to tell me how many bags. So bring my calculator back in. Divide by the 0.4. 6.6 .6 bags. Now, I can't go out and buy 6.6 .6 bags, so I've got to buy 7 bags to be able to cover this. So my driveway volume was this, 11 times 4 times 0 0.06, 2.64. The bags come in 0 0.4 metres cubed, so how many bags fit into this? Divide, 6.6 .6 .6 bags, but I've got to buy 7 bags to make this work. Each bag is £38, so seven lots of £38. Seven times 38 is £266. But then he gets a discount as well. He gets 30% off. So I've got to take 30% off this. Now the first thing I'm going to do is work out 10%. Now I like to do this without a calculator. The decimal points here, hop in once for 10%. So that's £26.60p. So I'm going to need another one of those, another one of those to get to 30%, £26.60 again, another two times, so £26.60 times by three is £79.80p, so he's going to get £79.80p discount, 266 take away now. £79.80p. So 266 take away £79.80 is £186.20. £186.20 for the five marks for this multi step problem here. First thing to do was to work out the volume base times height and then times it by how far it goes back. Make sure it's in metres as well. Each bag covers this, so how many will cover it? We need to divide. Can't buy 6.6 .6 bags, but you can buy seven. Seven lots of 38 came to 266 pound. We get 30% off, 10%, 10%, 10%, add them up, 79 pound and 80p off. And that comes to 186 pound and 20p for the five marks of this multi-step question, question number 11. Right, let's move on to question number 12. Okay, this question is split up into two parts, part A and part B. And for help with part A in particular, you can find support on the top 40, clip number 40. And again, that's for part A. Here are the first five terms of an arithmetic sequence. 4, 9, 14, 19, 24. Part A, find in terms of n an expression for the nth term of this sequence. Now the first thing we want to do is work out what the pattern is, what's happening here. And you can see that they're going up in fives. So I'm just going to put that in between each one, that plus five is the jump in between each number. Now that five goes in front of the n, 5n. Now to finish off this nth term expression, we need to work out what would be here if there was another number in front. So what would be here? So obviously the jump is plus 5, but when we go in this way, we're going to have to take off 5 from this 4. So it's going to be a minus 1 that would be there. And that completes the nth term expression for this sequence here. Find the jumps that goes in front of the n. Work out what would be there if there was another number 
and that goes next for the two marks for part A. And again, top 40, clip 40 for support with nth term expressions like this. Here are the first five terms of a different sequence. We've got 2, 2, 0, minus 4, minus 10. An expression for the nth term of this sequence is 3n minus n squared. So a different looking type of nth term expression here. Part B, write down in terms of n an expression for the nth term of a sequence whose first five terms are these. 4, 4, 0, minus 8, minus 20. Now this part is only worth one mark. So we've just got to really spot what's happened from there to there. 2, 2, 0, minus 4, minus 10 has actually all been doubled to go 4, 4, 0, minus 8, minus 20. Everything's just been doubled, so the nth term expression has just got to be doubled. So 3n minus n squared, if we just double that, that's going to be the nth term expression for this one. So if we double it by simply putting a 2 outside the bracket and then putting that expression here inside the bracket. So this sequence is 3n minus n squared. This one has all been doubled, so I just put a two outside the front of a bracket for the one mark. And that's the total three marks for question number 12. And again, support with this type of nth term expression, part A, top 40, clip number 40. Well, let's move on to question number 13. Okay, question 13 again is split up into A and B, and support with part A type questions again, you can find on the top 40, clip number 37. Now we've got minus five is less than y, which is less than or equal to zero. Y is an integer. Integer just means whole number. Part A, write down all the possible values of y. So what are the values that y could be? Now, again, 40 clip 37 for support on this type of question minus 5 is with the symbol without a dash so I'm not allowed the minus 5 but I am then allowed minus 4 all the way up so minus 4 minus 3 minus 2 minus 1 and the dash is on this number here so we do have the dash on the symbol with this number so I'm also allowed the 0 so minus 4 not the minus 5 because there's no dash and all the way up to zero, I am allowed the zero because there is a dash for the two marks. Part B, we've got a solving of an inequality now. So solve, we've got to work out what this value of x is to make this work. That symbol we can treat in our head just like an equal sign, but the brackets are in the way. So we've got to expand this side first. We've got to get rid of these brackets. So it's going to be six lots of what's inside the brackets here. So six lots of x is 6x. Take away sign, take away sign. Six lots of the 2 is 12. Then we've got our symbol and 15. Like we did earlier on in the exam paper, we've got to solve this for x. So I need to get rid of this minus 12 first by doing a plus 12, get rid of it. Let's do the same the other side of the symbol. So we've got 6x, this symbol, and now 27. This 6 has now got to go. At the moment, it's a times. The way of getting rid of it is doing a divide. Whatever I do this side, I must do this side. So divide by 6. So x is greater than, so we keep kept that symbol the same all the way through. And now I've got to do 27 divide by 6. 27 divided by 6 is 4.5 exactly. So x is greater than 4.5. I'm just going to put that on my dotted line here as well to finish off for the two marks. So solving an inequality, I've treated that exactly the same as an equal sign. I've just left it the same all the way through. Make sure it's the same in my answer as it is in the question. I've opened out my brackets. And then I've solved the equation. x is greater than 4.5 for the two marks. Top 40, clip 37 for support with part A type questions, and then we've got to solve for part B. Let's move on to question number 14. Okay, question 14's got quite a lot to read through, and it's worth five marks for this question. Ali is planning a party. He wants to buy some cakes and some sausage rolls. The cakes are sold in boxes. There are 12 cakes in each box, and each box of cakes costs £2.50. The sausage rolls are sold in packs. There are eight sausage rolls in each pack, and each pack of sausage rolls costs £1.20. 
Ali wants to buy more than 60 cakes and more than 60 sausage rolls. He wants to buy exactly the same number of cakes as sausage rolls. What is the least amount of money Ali will have to pay for these five marks? So what we need to do is build up in 12s until we get past 60, build up in eights until we've gone past 60, and find the first number that we get to that's the same for both. We'll worry about the £2.50s and the £1.20s after. So I'm just going to start two lists. One for cakes, one for sausage rolls. And I'm going to build up in 12s and build up in 8s. So let's start with the 12s for the cakes. So one box is 12 cakes, two boxes would be 24. I've just added 12 on. And I'm just going to keep adding 12s on. 36. You can use a calculator. We're in a calculator exam paper. But I'm just going to add 12s on here, so 36, then 48, 60, and the next one after 60 is 72. Now I may have to carry on, but I am just going to stop there in case this gets to 72 as well. But I can always come back and add another 12 on this side in case we do have to go a bit further than 72. So in terms of our 8s for our sausage rolls, we've got 8, 16, 24, 32. 2, 40, 48, 56, 64, and then 72 as well. We're past 60 for both, and we've got to the same number. So I'm going to need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 boxes of cakes, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 packs of sausage rolls. So I'm going to need to spend six lots of £2.50 and nine lots of £1.20. Let's write that down. So I'm going to need to work out six lots of my £2.50 and nine lots of my £1.20. I'm going to pull my calculator in at this point. So six times £2.50 is £15 exactly for the cakes. And for the sausage rolls, it's going to be nine lots of £1.20, which is £10.80p. And the question actually says, what's the least amount of money Ali will have to pay? Now that's this plus this. Again, write down all your work and anything that you're doing in your head or in your calculator. So 15 plus your £10.80. Now I'm not going to use a calculator for that. That's £25.80p. So £25.80 and 80p is the minimum he's going to have to pay. We've got to 72 with both by adding up in 12s and 8s. So that's six lots of the boxes and nine lots of the packs. So six lots of the £2.50, nine lots of the £1.20, and then all I've done, I've just added those, those two amounts to get to £25 and 80p for my five marks for question number 14. Right, let's move on to question number 15. Right, well, this question splits up into two parts again, A and B, and we can get support on this type of question with the top 40, clips 14 and 16. So two clips for this type of question. The diagram shows the position of three turbines, A, B and C. A is six kilometres due north of turbine B. So again, I'm just going to check that that's on my picture. So A is six kilometres due north, so that's straight north of turbine B, six kilometres. C is 4.5 kilometres due west, so north, east, south, west. So 4.5 kilometres due west of B. And again, that's on the picture here. Calculate the distance AC. So this line here, how long is this line? We've got here quite clearly in our picture a right angle triangle. I'm going to point my arrow away from my right angle. That's fine in the longest side of the right angle triangle, the hypotenuse. So that means it's an ad Pythagoras. I've got the two sides, I'm finding the third missing one. So in my working out here to calculate the distance AC, it's 6 squared, add 4.5 squared. 6 squared, add 4.5 squared comes to 56.25. 56.25. We've got to square root that number, so the square root of 56.25. So 
So square root of the answer is 7.5. And that's going on my dotted line for the three marks, 7.5 kilometers. And that was a straightforward Pythagoras from this right angle triangle. And again, you can get support with Pythagoras on clip 14 of the top 40. Point your arrow away. That's the one we find, which is the longest side, which means we add with the Pythagoras. Part B, calculate the bearing of C from A. Give your answer correct to the nearest degree. So we need to calculate the bearing, which is the angle of C from A. That means we're standing at A and we've got to turn from facing north clockwise until we face C. So let's have a look at that on the picture. We're standing at A, we're standing here, we're facing north, we've got to turn clockwise until we face C. So that means it's going to be this angle here. Now that part of the angle we can see straight away is going to be 180 degrees, it's a straight line. But then this part of the angle here we need to work out. So I need to work out this angle here. I'm just going to put an X on the picture because I need to work out that angle. Now I've got a right angle triangle, I'm finding an angle and I've got two sides. So that's going to be trigonometry, our Sokotoa. And we've wrote down Sokotoa at the start in the formula sheet to remind us. So I'm just going to pop Sokotoa down now. So some old horses can always hear their owners approach. And again, loads of different ways of remembering that. That's the way I remember Sokotoa. We're going to come back to that in a second. We've got to go and label up our triangle. This is the angle we're looking at. So opposite, a big O for opposite. Adjacent is the posh word for next to. And we already have said that this is our hypotenuse. Now, I know we've worked out this in part A, but I don't want to use the value of this 7.5 because I want to use the ones that were given in the question. Just in case this is wrong, I've made an error in part A. So I'm not going to use that one. I'm going to use O and A. O and A is tan. So tan X equals O on top of A, 4.5 on top of 6. 4.5 on top of six. Now that means straight away a divide. When I'm finding an angle, I've got a shift tan. So 4.5 divided by six, press equals, shift tan to work out the, the angle. So 4.5 divided by six, get that answer first, 0.75, and then shift tan, press equals, 36.86. I'm gonna write down the lot at this point. That comes to 36. 0.86989765 degrees. Don't forget that's this angle here. I need to add on my 180 degrees. So I need to add on, don't forget for the bearing, we need to add on this 180 degrees. So I'm just going to bring that straight into the calculator plus 180 degrees, which is 216. 0.86989765. Seven six degrees, and the final part of this question says, "Give your answer correct to the nearest degree." So it's two hundred and sixteen degrees and a bit, but that bit there, this number here, is above five, which is going to shoot that up to two hundred and seventeen degrees for the four marks for part B, which is using quite a bit of maths. There, we're going to have to know our facts about bearings and also our Sokotoa finding angles which is the top 40 clip number 16 for support with part b and using the shift sin shift car shift tan to work out an angle with soccer toa so 217 degrees for part b well, let's move on to question number 16. Okay, this question's worth two marks and we've got some standard form here. Work out the value of 7.5 times 10 to the power of 4 times 2.5 times 10 to the power of 3. Give your answer in standard form. Now when it comes to multiplying standard forms, we can multiply the front two numbers. And then if you remember with indices and what we talked about earlier on in this video clip, we can actually add the powers when the bases are the same. So let's just deal with that 7.5 times 2.5 first, which is 18.75, times by 10, 
and I can just add the powers on the tens because they're the same base. So four plus three is seven. Now it says here, give your answer in standard form. Now that looks like standard form, but it's not because the front number has got to be bigger than one and smaller than 10. Now I can change that by hopping the decimal point one more time back in. So 1.875, now that's between one and 10. I've made that smaller by one hop, so I'm gonna have to make this bigger by one number, so 10 to the power of eight. So it's 1.875 times 10 to the power of eight for the two marks for question 16. Let's move on to question 17. Question 17 is in two parts, A and B, two marks for each, four marks in total. We've got two quadrilaterals, and it says here quadrilaterals A, B, C and D, A, B, C and D, and L, M, N and P, this one and this one are mathematically similar. Mathematically similar means it's an enlargement. So this has been enlarged by a scale factor to get to this one, and whatever you do to one side, multiply it out, you've got to do it to all the others to get from the smaller to the bigger. It says here, angle A equals angle M, angle B equals angle M, angle C equals angle N, and angle D equals angle P. So really it's just stating that this is an enlargement, so the angles are going to stay exactly the same. Part A, work out the length of Al P, this one here. So we've got our five, which is on the smaller version on this side. So five times something gets to this side. Now what you have to do is find the side that's in common. And what I mean by that, that you've been given the information for the same side. Now that one there is missing, but you've got the 12, but you do have the base and the base. So this is where we're gonna find our scale factor. What do you times six by to get to nine? So it's six lots of something to get to nine, and to work that out in the calculator, you just do nine divided by six. So six times something gets to nine. So nine divided by six, is 1.5. So 6 times 1.5, that's our scale factor. This is one and a half times bigger than the smaller one here. And that's going to be the same on all the sides. So to get to Al P, this one here, it's going to be 5 times 1.5. And I'm going to put that out in my work in here. So it's 5 times 1.5. 5 times 1.5 is 7.5. So 7.5 centimeters for two marks to get LP. We've worked out the scale factor, five times that scale factor. Work out the length BC. So BC is actually on the smaller one here, this one, and I've got the 12 for the bigger one. So if we multiply with the scale factor to go this way, we've got to divide with the scale factor to come back. So it's gonna be 12 divided by 1.5 to come back to the smaller one. So 12 divided by 1.5 for my working out. 12 divided by 1.5 is exactly eight centimeters for the two marks for part B. So mathematically similar means an enlargement. Find the scale factor to go from the smaller to the bigger we times, to go from the bigger back to the smaller, we do a divide, times and then a divide for question 17. Moving on to question number 18. Okay, question 18 is split into two parts, A and B, three marks for each, six marks in total for this question. Katie invests £200 into a savings account for two years. The account pays compound interest at an annual rate of 3.3% for the first year, 1.5% for the second year. Part A, work out the total amount of money in Katie's account at the end of the two years. Compound interest means we've got to work out 3.3% of £200 first, add it on, get a new amount for the end of that first year, and then 1.5% of that new amount to work out the second year. So compound interest means we've got to do it one year at a time. £200 is what we're starting with. Now there's loads of different ways of dealing with this type of question, but I think I'm going to go with a multiplier method. So we're going to use some multipliers to do this. So 200 pound first for the first year multiplied by it's increased so it's a one point now it's increased by 3.3 percent now because 3.3 is less than 10 percent i've got to put a zero first then i can just put three three so multipliers one point means an increase zero it's less than 10 
I can put a three and a three straight away for the 3.3%. So that's my first year. So 200 multiplied by 1.033, 206 pound and 60p. 206 pound and 60p, that's my first year. Now the second year, I've got to deal with this number. So 206 pound and 60p multiplied by, again it's increased to one point, 1 1.5% is less than 10, so I've got to put another zero, then I can put my 1.5. So 206 pound and 60 still there, times by 1.015, 209.69. I'm going to write that down first. Now you can't have pounds and pence that look like this. So that nine is going to shoot that up to 209 pound and 70 pence for the three marks for part A. Now you can work through this type of question by finding 10%, 1%, 0.1%, adding it up to 3.3%, adding it on then to the 200 to get to this number, then starting all over again with 10%, 1%, half a percent, and add it back on to get to your 209 pound and 70p. But I decided to go with some multipliers this time. 200 is what you're starting with multiplied by one point is an increase, but the zero one because it's less than 10. If you put 1.33, you end up doing 33%. So you've got to put the zero in there, then put your three, three, get this value, use that again with your increase again, your one point zero because it's less than 10 and then one five. And that comes to 209 pound and 70 P when you round it. Katie travels to work by train. The cost of a weekly train ticket increases by 12.5% to £225. Katie's weekly pay increases by 5% to £535.50. We've got an asterisk here, so we're going to get marked on our quality of written communication. We're going to have to put a sentence somewhere to finish this off. Part B, compare the increase in the amount of money Katie has to pay for a weekly train ticket with the increase in her weekly pay. Now, we don't know what the value of this train ticket was before the increase to work out what the actual value increase was, and we don't know what her weekly pay was before the increase. So this is gonna be reverse percentages. We've gotta use this percentage to go back in time, what was it before the increase, and what was her pay before the increase? Now I like to deal with this with a question mark to start with. This is what the, we'll do the train ticket first. This is what the train ticket was before the increase. So they applied a multiplier of a one point to increase this train ticket. And it's not less than 10, so I don't need to put a zero. I can just put the one, two, five straight in. And that comes to 225 pound. Now it's a reverse because I don't know what it was before in the past. So I need to do a divide. So 225, working backwards, divide by 1.125. So 225, divide by the 1.125. The price of this train ticket before the increase was 200 pounds. Let's write down here what I did. 225, divide by the 1.125 is 200 pounds. So now I can see that the train ticket has increased by, it went up by 25 pounds. That's what the train ticket did, £25. Now we need to do the same with her weekly wage. We don't know what it was before the increase. We know she's had a 5% increase, so they applied a one point, less than 10, zero, five, and it comes out as £535.50p. So to work backwards to what a wage was before the increase, we do a divide, so 535.5 divide by the 1.0 five so five three five fifty divide by the 1.05 five hundred and ten pound so her wage was five hundred and ten pound it's gone up to five hundred and thirty five pound fifty so you can see there that there's twenty five pound and fifty pence increase in her wage so the train ticket was 200, we did a reverse percentage, and it's gone up to 225. So we can see that the train ticket has gone up by 25 pound. Doing the same thing with the wage, working backwards to find what a wage was, because we know the current value, 
We knew it was increased by 5%, so we worked backwards. £510, we can see there that's a £25.50p increase. So a wage has gone up just by 50p more than the increase of the train. So don't forget, this is a starred question, so I'm gonna to have to put some kind of sentence there. So I'm just gonna keep it quite short. Pay increases by 50p more than the ticket increase. Just to finish off to get that final mark because it's a starred question. And again, I've dealt with this question with multiplier percentages. And this one is a reverse percentage because you're going back in the past to what it was before for the three marks there for question number 18. Let's move on to question number 19. Here is a cuboid drawn on a 3D grid. So we're going to have 3D coordinates here. Our x-axis, our y-axis, and now the z-axis. P is a vertex of the cuboid. So it's this corner of the cuboid here. T divides the line OP. Now there is no line OP, but what I'm going to try and do here is just imagine it coming it all the way through from the corner there, 0, 0, 0, all the way up to P and it divides the line in the ratio of one to two. So T, that means it's gonna be a third of the way along that line. So T is a third of the way along the line. Find the coordinates of T, and this is worth two marks. Now, if T is part way along this line that's coming diagonally through this cuboid, I need to know where it starts, which is zero, 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 and the coordinate of P, where it finishes. Now along the corridor for X, now this is on the right hand side of the shape, so it meets six, so it's six. It's at the top of the shape, so it's four, and it's also at the front of the shape, so on the Z axis, it's the furthest it can come out, is a three. So we've got zero, zero, zero for where this line starts, and six, four, three to where it finishes. I know that T is one third along the line, so if it chops it in, one to two, so it's gonna be one part this side of it and two parts that side, so it's a third of the way along the line. So I need to get a third of the way from zero to six, zero to four, and zero to three. So the easiest way to do a third would be to divide this number by three. So if I do six divided by three, that's gonna be two. If I do four divided by three, and that's one and a third. And again, when I calculate our exam paper, so you can do it and double check, it's so a four divided by three is 1.33333, which is one and a third. So it's gonna be one and a third for that coordinate. And then three divided by three is one. So I've added on this extra line just so I can kind of visualize it a little bit, what this line OP is. T is one third of its way along it. It starts at zero, 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 it ends at six, four, three, so I need a third of these three numbers. A third of six is two, a third of four is one and a third, and a third of three is one for the two marks for question 19. Let's move on to question number 20. Okay, question number 20 is worth three marks, and you can find support on this type of question with the functional skills videos for averages. 25 students in class A did a science exam. 30 students in class B did the same science exam. The mean mark for the 25 students in class A is 67.8. The mean mark for all 55 students is 72.0. Work out the mean mark for the students in class B B. So we've got the mean mark for class A, we've got the mean mark for all of them, so I need to somehow do some taking away to see what's left over for class B. So if, let's go back and think about what mean actually means. Mean is where you add them all up, all the scores, divide by how many you've got, and it gives you an average, the mean. So when it comes to class A to start with, let's just deal with this class A here. We don't know what they all add up to yet, but when you divide it by 25, it comes to 67.8. Now, if I want to work out this, it's a bit like the reverse percentages. That's a divide, so to go back to this number here, I'll just do a times. So if I do 25 times 67.8, that's going to give me what the total score was for class 
A. So 25 times 67 point eight comes out as 1695 so that's for class A that's a total score now I can do the same thing for everyone here I don't know what they all add up to but when we divided it by 55 for everyone this is not just class B now this is everyone comes to 72.0 and if I want to work out what everyone added up to I'm just going to do the reverse and do a times so 55 times by 72.0 so 55 times by 72.0 comes to 3960 3960 so that's class A that's everyone if I want to work out class B first of all I'm going to take this away from this to see what the total of class B was so let's do 3960 take away 1695 so 3960 take away 1695 comes to 2265 if there are 55 pupils in total and there were 25 in class A that leaves 30 students exactly in class B and this is what they add up to 2, 2, 6, 5 to find the mean divided by the 30 that's in that class so it's 2, 2, 6, 5 divided by 30 75.5 so I'll write it here and I'll put it here 75 0.5. So what I've done, I've just imagined what mean actually means. You add them all up, which you don't know what, for class A, and you would have divided by 25 gives you the average here, the mean 67.8. Do a times to work out what they all would have added up to, 1,695, and that's for class A. This is for all, we did the same method. We don't know what they all added up to. Divide by 55 comes to the 72 in the question, so do a times. If we do a quick takeaway between these two, that leaves class B. And then to find the mean of class B, just divide by the 30, because there's 30 students. Because you can see 25 in class A, 55 in total. So that means there's 30 students. So divide by the 30 gives you 75.5 for the three marks for question 20. And again, support, functional skills, video clip for averages for help with question 20. Moving on to question number... 21. Right, 21 is split into two parts, A and B. A is worth two marks and B is worth three marks and we've got a star for part B. Now you can get support on the top 40 clip 39 for part A type questions. Expand and simplify with double brackets. This is the parrot method. So the first has got to multiply the first. The first has also got to multiply the second. And then the second has got to multiply the first and the second has multiplied the second. And if you put your arcs in the right place, you've got your beak for a parrot. Put your eyes on. There you go. So we're going to follow those arcs. The first arc was the smaller on the top. So y times y is y squared. The second arc was the bigger one on the top, which is y times a minus 5. So that means it's a minus 5y. Then we go to the smaller arc on the bottom, which is a 2 times a y, but it's a minus 2. So minus 2y. And the final arc is the bigger one on the bottom, which is 2 times 5, which is a 10. Minus and a minus, make sure it's a plus 10. We're going to chop up all of these terms and tidy them up. Now the first term is a y squared and there's no other squared term, so that's not going to change. The 10 at the end, the plus 10, is the only one as a number on its own. These have all got letters, so plus 10 at the end is going to stay the same. It's these two in the middle that need tidying up. Now minus 5y take away 2y. That means I've lost 5y's, I've lost £5, and I've lost another £2. I've not done well today. I've lost 5, I've lost 2, that means I've lost 7y's in total. First term stays the same, last term stays the same, these two in the middle need tidying up, and this is the parrot method for part A. And again, support with clip number 39 on that type question. Now part B has got an asterisk, so we need to finish off with a sentence, our quality of written communication again. Prove algebraically that this here is an even number for all positive integer values of n. So we've got a lot of brackets and squares and stuff here, so the first thing I'm going to do with this prove algebraically, I'm going to tidy all this up, expand this out and tidy it up. 
So 2n plus 1, all squared, actually looks like this. 2n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. Take away this 2n plus 1. This here is just what we've done up in part A, which is our double bracket, our parrot method. So I'm going to apply the parrot method here on part B as well. There's my eyes. So let's follow the arcs. We're going to ignore this for a second. We'll add this on after. So 2n times 2n is going to be 4n squared. 2n times the 1 is just a plus 2n. The same with this one, plus 2n. And then 1 times 1 is plus 1. So I've expanded this part here. Minus this lot. So minus 2n minus the 1. So I've got this long line now here that needs tidying up. Let's chop it up for each term and tidy it up. 4n squared is my only one with a squared on. Now I've got a plus 2n, a plus 2n, and a takeaway 2n. So I've got 4n, takeaway 2n, leaves me with 2n. And I've got a plus 1 and a takeaway 1, which disappear. So that's this all tidied up. But what I am going to do now is factorise this. I'm going to tidy it up and put it back into brackets. So a 2 can come out, and an n can come out. Open my bracket. 2 times 2 to get back to the 4, and an n times an n to get back to the n squared. And to get from 2n to 2n, I just need to add 1. So what I've done, I've just expanded everything here and tidied it all up, and it's come back to, after factorising, 2n, open brackets, 2n plus 1. But my job was to prove algebraically that this, so this here, is an even number for all positive integer values of n. And what that means is positive whole numbers. So what we've got to think of here is what happens. So 2 times any number is always even. 2 times an odd number is even, and 2 times an even number is even. So this part here always comes out to being even, because 2 times any number is even. So that, inside the bracket now, 2 times any number is even, but when you add 1, it always comes out to being odd. So 2 lots of an even number is even, add 1 makes it odd. 2 times an odd number is even, but add 1 makes it odd. So 2 times any number is even, we've just said, said that here, and 2 times any number plus 1 is always going to be odd. So what I've got here is an even, definitely an even number on the outside, times an odd number. So I've definitely got an even times an odd. Now an even times an odd number always comes out to being even. Even multiplied by odd is always even. And that's my finishing statement here for this part B. So it's quite a tricky question, this one, this part B. I've had to expand everything. I've tidied it up and then factorised and then thought very slowly, right, two times any number is even. 2 times any number is even in here, but when you add 1 onto it, it always comes to an odd number. So I've got an even times an odd, and an even times an odd always comes out even. Even multiplied by odd is always even for the three marks here for part B. And again, you can get support on the top 40 clip 39 for part A, this parrot method, which we did actually use again for part B. Right, moving on to question number 22. Question number 22 is yet again another starred question. Shabin has a biased coin. The probability that the coin will land on heads is 0.6. Shabin is going to throw the coin three times. She says that the probability that the coin will land on tails three times is less than 0.1. Is Shabin correct? You must show all your work in. So the starred part will be to put a little sentence at the end just saying yes or no whether she is correct. And this question is worth three marks for question 22. Right, so the coin is going to be thrown three times, and we want to know the probability, really, of it landing on tails all three times. Now, the probability it lands on a head is 0.6, so the probability it lands on a tail has got to be what's left over, which is 0.4. 
Now, because we're doing three things straight after each other, we're going to multiply because we want to know the probability of it being a tail and a tail and a tail. So, and we're going to multiply. So it's going to be 0 0.4 times 0 0.4 times 0.4 our calculator for this so 0 0.4 times 0 0.4 times 0 0.4 comes out as 0 0.064 so the probability of it landing on tails all three times is 0 0.064 which is less than 0 0.1 so yes Shabin is correct for our three marks for question 22 and all we had to do was make sure we've got the right value of the probability so we've got the 0 0.4 for the tail because we're doing three 0 0.4 times 0 0.4 times 0 0.4 because we want to know if it lands on tail tail then tail again so we multiply comes to 0 0.064 which yes is less than 0 0.1 yes Shabin is correct for question 22 Moving on to question number 23. Question 23 split up into two parts, part A and part B, and it's worth three marks overall for this question. Part A, explain what is meant by a stratified sample for one mark. Now, a stratified sample is where the sample is in the same proportion as the entire population, as the population we're talking about within the question. So let's write that here, so sample, is in the same proportion as the population and what this exactly means will be shown in terms of part b on how we work this out so the sample is in the same proportion as the population the table shows information about the ages of the people living in a village age group number of people Mrs. Parrish carries out a survey of these people. She uses a sample size of 50 people stratified by age group. Part B, work out the number of people over 60 years of age in the sample. So first of all, let's go back to the population, which is what we meant here. The population is 314 people that are over 60. So it's 314 people out of this population. Now, the population is going to be these numbers added up here. So, 72 plus 90 plus 123 plus 314, it's 599 people in this population. So, 314 out of 599. Now, if I was to do the divide here, then multiply by 100, that's going to give me my percentage. So, 314 divide by 599 press equals times 100 it's 52.42 i'm going to write the whole number down so 52.4207017 percent so this represents just over 52 percent of our population so that means i've got to work out 52 percent of 50. so if i do 50 divided by 100 and then multiply it by my 52.4207017. That's going to tell me what 52% is, or just over 52% is, of 50. 50 divided by 100, 100 and then multiply by 52.4207017. And that comes to 26. Point, I'm going to, again, I'm going to write down the entire number. 5059 but I can't have 26.2 people so it's going to be 26 people for two marks out of my sample of 50 that represent the over 60s so let's go back to this the sample is in the same proportion as the population 314 out of 599 is 52 percent or just over 52 percent so i need to apply the same proportion the same percentage of my sample so 52 percent or just over 52 percent of the 50 just over 26 i can't have just over 26 people but i can have 26 people that represent the over 60s in my sample of 50 for question 23 part b for those those two marks 
Let's move on to question number 24. Question 24 is worth three marks. P is inversely proportional to T. When T equals four, P equals 12, find the value of P when T equals six. Now inversely proportional means I'm gonna put P and this funny fish kind of symbol, which is the proportional symbol, is proportional to one over T. Now that means inversely. Now I'm gonna change that to an equal sign, but I'm gonna put the K instead of that one there. So P equals K over T. When T equals four, this number here, P equals 12. So 12 equals K over four. So something divided by four equals 12. So I could just to work out K is going to be four lots of 12, which is 48. So I've worked out my value of K, this constant of proportionality. So I can go back to this one and start all over again. So P equals 48 now over T. Find the value of P when T equals six. So when T equals six, it's gonna be 48 divided by six. So P equals 48 divided by six is exactly eight. So my answer, when T equals six, P equals eight. And the main thing to remember here is that this part here. So P is proportional to one over, which is the inverse part. It change it to an equal sign and multiply by K. So one times K is just K, so it's K over T. Plug in the two numbers that are given in the question, which is 12 and four. So something divided by four equals 12 times, which is 48. Plug it back in to this one here, and then you can actually work out the value of P when T equals six. 48 divided by six is eight for three marks for question 24. Moving on to question number 25. Question number 25 is worth three marks. The diagram shows a solid made from a hemisphere and a cone. So we've got this cone on the top, hemisphere, which is half a sphere joined to the bottom, a complete height of 14 centimeters, and then, then this four centimeters here. The radius of the hemisphere is four centimeters. The radius of the base of the cone is four centimeters. Calculate the volume of this solid. Give your answer correct to three significant figures. Now this question is that perfect example of what I said at the start of the clip, how important and how vital it is that you remember to keep looking back at this formula sheet. And you can see here, volume of a cone, the formula's given, and volume of a sphere, the formula's given. And I know a hemisphere is half of a sphere, so whatever this comes out as, we'll just half it for the hemisphere. But we've got both formulas written down here at the start of the exam paper. So let's start off with the volume of the cone. So I'm just gonna transfer that formula first, for volume of a cone, which is a third pi r squared h. I'm gonna do volume of the cone first which is a third pi r squared h. Now, we've got to be careful because the height of the cone is not 14. 14 is the height of the whole of this solid. But if four centimeters is the radius of the hemisphere or the radius of the sphere, then it's also going to be four centimeters down to the bottom. So if we want to chop it off there, that's going to be four centimeters. So that bit's going to be 10 centimeters. So let's just make sure we've got the right height for the cone to start with for this formula. So volume of the cone is going to be a third times pi times the radius, which was four centimeters squared times the height, which is 10. So I can just type all that in one go into the calculator for the volume of the cone. So we've got a third, I'm gonna type it in as a fraction of the calculator. So we've got one third times by pi times by four squared times by 10. So there's the formula literally as I've wrote it down in the calculator. And I'm gonna jot down all of those numbers that I can see. So 167.55160 82, so that's the cone sorted. Now we're gonna do the volume of the hemisphere. And the formula from the front page is four over three pi r cubed. 
So it's going to be 4 over 3 pi r cubed, but then I'm going to have to put it all over 2, divide it by 2, half it at the end, because it's half a sphere, and that's what I've just transferred from the front formula sheet. So it's going to be 4 over 3 times pi times by 4 cubed, and then I'm going to half my answer at the end for the volume of the hemisphere. So again, I'm going to use this button here, so 4 thirds, 4 over 3, times by pi, times by 4 cubed, I'm going to get an answer for that first, and then I'm just going to divide it by 2, which is 134.04 So the answer is going to be this one plus this one. And again, I'm just going to show that to make sure I get all my working out marks that are available for this question, plus the 134.04.12866. So plus 167.5516082, and that comes out as 301.59. Again, I'm gonna jot everything, else, everything down that I can see on this display first. 5928948. The question says, give your answer correct to three significant figures, which is the first three numbers, but you do have to check the one the next number, and that five is big enough to shoot that up to 302 centimetres cubed for the volume of this solid here. And we've done it in two parts. The volume of the cone, just checking the height, making sure that we've got the right number for the height, which is 10 for the cone get that from the formula sheet at the front. Volume of the hemisphere is half of the volume of a sphere, which is again from the front, and we've got the numbers available to put straight into it. Add these two together, and then do our rounding to three significant figures for our final answer of 302 for those three marks for question number 25. Right, moving on to question number 26. Question 26 is worth five marks, and we've got solve the equations x squared plus y squared equals 36, and x equals 2y plus 6. Simultaneous equations, one that's got squared parts on one hasn't. We're going to solve this by substituting this one, the non-squared one, into the one with the squares on. So where I see x here, I'm just going to write 2y plus 6. And what that will do is eliminate the x's and we'll just have y's to deal with. So where I see x here, I'm going to write 2y plus 6. So it's 2y plus 6, but that's going to be squared plus y squared equals 36. Now this, from what we've seen earlier in the exam paper, can be rewritten as 2y plus 6 with another bracket, 2y plus 6. Don't forget our plus y squared equals 36. This is our parrot method, so we're going to put our arcs on. I'm going to put the i's on, so I remember to follow little big, little big. So 2y times 2y is 4y squared. 2y times the plus 6 is plus 12y. The same for this one. And then plus 36. Don't forget again, our plus y squared equals 36. Let's chop this up and tidy it up. 4y squared plus y squared is a 5y squared, plus 24y. Now I want this equal to 0, so I'm going to take 36 off there, and take 36 off that side. So that now just equals 0. I've got a quadratic equation where a is 5, b, the term here is 24, and c, there is no c term, is 0. A, B, C. Now, again, remembering the front exam page, that formula sheet, we've got the quadratic equation here. Y, instead of X, though, equals minus B plus or minus a square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. I'm just going to transfer that over here. So Y equals minus B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2 a and I'm going to plug a, b, and c into this. So y equals minus b, which is minus 24, plus or minus. So we have two versions of this. 
the square root of b squared, so 24 squared, take away 4 times 5, which is 20, times by 0, which is 0, all over 2a, which is 2 times 5, which is 10. So let's tidy that up a bit. So that's going to be minus 24 plus or minus. Now it's going to be the square root of 24, but square 24 as well. So that's just going to balance off, isn't it? The minus 0 is actually nothing, but the square root and the square actually cancel each other off. So it's going to be plus or minus 24 over 10. So I'm going to have two possible answers for y here. The first one is going to be minus 24 plus 24 over 10. And the second one is going to be minus 24 take away 24 over 10. Now minus 24 plus 24 is 0 and 0 divided by 10 is 0. And minus 24 take away 24 goes down to minus 48. Minus 48 divided by 10 is minus 4.8. So I've got two values of y. My two values of y are 0 and minus 4.8. Now to get my corresponding values of x, I just need to plug it into here. So plug 0 and minus 4.8 into here. So I'm going to have two possible sets of answers. So when y equals 0, that one's going to be quite easy, 2 times 0 is 0, plus 6 is 6. x equals 6. So there's my first answer, y equals 0, x equals 6. And when y equals minus 4.8, let's put it into the calculator, it's going to be 2 lots of minus 4.8. I'm going to press equals at that point and then add 6, minus 3.6 for the value of x. So x equals minus 3.6. So there's my two sets of answers. I've got 0, 6. When I've got 0 out of the quadratic equation here, I plugged it back into the nice easy one. 2 times 0 plus 6 is 6. And the minus 4.8 that I got from the quadratic equation, when I plug that back into here, 2 times minus 4.8 add 6 comes out as minus 3.6. So there's my two sets of answers for these simultaneous equations. I substituted the non-squared one into the squared, like we've done throughout this exam paper already, expanded the brackets, chopped it up and tidied it up, a, b and c, into the formula here, minus b, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. The plus and the minus give me two different versions, a 0 and a minus 4.8, and I plugged those in to this second equation to get these values of x for the full five marks. Right, moving on to the final question, question number 27. Okay, question number 27 then is worth five marks. A, B, C, D is a parallelogram. It's been chopped up into two equal triangles. AC, this line here is nine centimeters. DC is 11 centimeters. Calculate the area of the parallelogram. Give your answer correct to three significant figures. Now, what we need to do really is deal with this one triangle, work out the area of the triangle, and it's a non-right angle triangle, but then once we've got the area of it, double it up. Now think about that formula sheet yet again. At the bottom here, area of a triangle is a half AB sine C. Now, the letters A and B and the, the angle C means that we need this angle here to be sitting in the middle of the two sides. So I need to work out ultimately, I think first, this angle here to be able to use that half AB sine C formula, which is the area of a non-right angle triangle that we can work out here and then double it up for the parallelogram. But the problem with this one is to use the sine rule or the cosine rule, those rules, I need matching pairs. I need opposite sides. And I can't do anything because I've got both of them missing. So if I look at this angle first, I've got a matching pair when I find it, and I've already got a matching pair here. So this can be the sine rule now. So I've got a matching pair, and yet again, the sine rule's available here in the formula sheet. And don't forget, this can be the other way round. So sine A on top of A, sine B on top of B, sine C on top of C, when we're finding out an angle, which is what we're doing here. So I'm trying to find this angle here. So I'm going to call that X. 
So sine x over its opposite side, 9, is equal to the matching pair, which is sine 100 over 11. Quite straightforward. This is going to be a divide, and then I'm just going to times it by my 9. So it's sin 100, I'm going to press equals there, divide by 11, press equals again, times by 9, press equals again. I'm finding x, so I've got to do shift sin of that answer. So x comes out as 53.68292309 degrees. Again, don't forget, I'm trying to get this angle here that's sitting in between the two sides for a half AB sine C formula to work out the area of a triangle. So I need to do 180 degrees, take away the 100 degrees, and take away the 53.68292309 degrees. So I'm going to leave that number on my display there. So it's going to be 180, take away the answer, take away 100. And that gives me 26.31 degrees. So 26.31707691 degrees. Now I've got the angle here. I've got the 11 and a 9. So I can substitute it into that formula for the area of a triangle, which is a half AB sine C. So the area of one of the triangles, area of the triangle, or the first triangle, is going to be a half times A, which can be the 9, times the B, times the 11, times the sin, and this 26.31707691. Put that into the calculator. So 0 0.5 times 9, times 11, times sin of 26.31707691. And that comes out as an answer for the area of the triangle is 21.9452491 centimetres squared. And again, we're at, that's only the triangle, so I need to double this up, times it by 2 for the area of the whole parallelogram. So double that up, times by 2, comes out as 43.8904983 centimetres squared. The question says, give your answer correct to three significant figures. Three significant figures, which are the first three numbers. One, two, three. We must check the next one number along, which is big enough to shoot this up to 43.9 centimetres squared. So with this final question, we actually dealt with it as a non-right angle triangle and look to the formulas that are in that formula sheet at the front of the exam, the sine rule in the area of a triangle. We had to do a bit of movement around to actually get the right angle. We could get this one first by using a matching pair and the nine with the sine rule. And then we did 180 take away what we just worked out and the 100 degrees to get this angle here in between the nine and the 11. Then we can apply the area of the triangle, a half AB sine C, and then we just doubled that up and then applied the rounding that was required in the question for the full five marks for that question number 27. Great. Well, I hope you've done well on that exam paper. Well done and good luck.